Hi, good morning. I hope everybody's ready and on board. If you are, wave your hand and greet your, there we go. Got some phone only people, but I see Barry is uh, clapping for us. Hey, Cheryl, thanks, welcome. Good morning. Welcome to uh, Jackson Community Church Online for our Sunday morning service. And uh, you may know that Pastor Gail is away for the weekend for the wedding of her daughter, Sarah, to Nehru. I'm Tom Pizer, one of our deacons, and I'll be uh, helping with the service this morning. And we have Jeanette Heidman, our moderator, as well as our technology guru, helping behind the scenes to make the computer work. Our music this morning is from Alan Labrie, our resident organist and composer. Very fortunate this morning to have Dan Weir with us. Reverend Canon Daniel Weir was educated at the uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst and then at the Episcopal Divinity School in uh, Cambridge. He pastored parishes in Western Massachusetts and then in Western New York, and then moving up to where he was part of the diocese and staff in uh, Western New York and chairman of the uh, Erie County Commission on Homelessness. So I'm very pleased to have him here with us. Uh, Dan, after having lived across the upper Northeast, uh, discovered uh, the Mount Washington Valley and met his wife, Jan, and they became married and uh, have retired here to Intervale to enjoy the beautiful White Mountains and hopefully live a happy, happily retired life. Today's service will be a little simpler than uh, what you see most Sundays because we don't have the technology duo of uh, Gail and Chris Doctor. So please put up with the fact that there won't be any words on your screen for readings uh, and, and prayers and music, but I think we can all pull together and make this happen as it is. I have three announcements to make for you. Uh, the racial justice conversation uh, resumes on Wednesday. There are two sessions, uh, 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Uh, C3, the cocktails and Christian conversations on Friday afternoons uh, will take place this week, and it's been a very successful program, and uh, th there will be a new session opening up uh, sometime in a few weeks. And the Young People's Choir and Band uh, will meet on Monday, uh, virtually be meeting, and uh, Billy Carlton, our uh, choral director, will be sending out a link for that. Now I ask you just to uh, relax, Make sure that you are muted and listen as Alan LeBray plays our music to begin our worship service. Good morning, church. Good to see a, a lot of uh, familiar names, uh, as well as some familiar faces. Uh, I'm very thankful to your 
wonderful pastor and my great colleague, Gail Doctor, for inviting me to be with you this morning. I've come to know over the last few months that my colleagues who are still working in active ministry are working very, very hard here in the Mount Washington Valley uh, to keep connected to all the wonderful people and their congregations and to develop some new skills and some new approaches to ministry. As is your custom here, we uh, begin our worship now with some time of prayer. Uh, invite you to shout out, speak out your concerns. Uh, as one of my friends, I, I told one of my friends and a parishioner that uh, we often think that we should leave our baggage at the door of church when we come in the morning. And I said, you're not supposed to leave your baggage. You're supposed to begin, bring it and offer it up to God, your concerns and uh, as well as your joy. So let's begin with concerns and just speak them out. Speak them out. I'll go. My name's Kevin. Is it okay to go? Yeah, fine, okay. Kevin. Prayer, prayer for John Lewis and his John Lewis who passed away and his family. Um, prayer for Sue for who had back surgery. Prayer for Reverend Gail and Chris and their daughter Sarah and the rest of the family. And prayer for my friend Jennifer. Yeah, yeah we hold all those folks in prayer this morning. Other concerns? I know there are some others that Gail told me about before she went down to New York. She reminded me that um, here are some folks who are about to undergo surgery from this community. Sue and Kevin, Cheryl, Judy, Deanna, Sasha and Jim. And uh, for Cheryl and Claire and several other people who are living with cancer, which is a, 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 a real work of patience and of trust in God to live with uh, this disease. Uh, pray, pray for Barry, who has a spinal injury and he recovers. Maureen, uh, her sister Tish has asked us for prayers. Uh, Lori has asked us for prayers for her brother-in-law, Mike. Fred's been asked for Can uh, Nancy, a member of the community. And we always pray for our national, local, and uh, world leaders, especially during this time of uh, pandemic, uh, for all those who have lost both uh, loved ones, their own health and, and economic stability. Uh, we remember Richard Gustin as he rehabs after his second stroke. And then we remember as always here at Jackson Community Church, the communities in Zimbabwe, and Honduras, uh, with whom this congregation is linked in prayer and support. Any other concerns? If you'd like to... Tom, you're muted. Okay, how's this? Okay, if you'd like to uh, raise a prayer or concern, uh, you need to unmute yourself and then speak. Yeah, I'd like to ask for prayers for our daughter, Kristen, who has been discovered to have breast cancer and is facing an uphill battle. Uh, so we hold her in our prayers this day. Well, turning to celebrations, I have we've already heard a, a prayer for Chris and Gail as they are in New York City on uh, Roosevelt Island uh, for Sarah and Nuru's wedding today. Uh, a great celebration. What other celebrations are people remembering this day? I'll go, Reverend. Yeah. I'm grateful for all the dogs at the campground I work at, and all when I see the eagles and the hawks soaring in the sky lately, I can imagine what it feels like to be them 
and I saw a mouse outside of my apartment. It was cute. And I saw some turkeys across the road. So I'm grateful for all of that. I know Gail uh, reminded me that Lee and Meg are celebrating 50 years of marriage this weekend. So mm -hmm. congratulations to them. Continued blessing for them in their life together. All right, I invite you to unmute yourselves if you care to as we join in that prayer that our Savior Jesus Who art in heaven, and hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, you forgive us our sins, for thine is not into temptation, the first evil. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Have the reading this morning. That Reverend Dan selected. Today's reading is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, so that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light appeared from heaven and flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he could see nothing, and they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Taurus, of Tarsus, named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen a vision that a man named Ananias came in, and laid his hands upon him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before the Gentiles and kings, and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, 
Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. So ends the reading. Dan? Let us pray. Gracious God, may our thinking and our speaking be always to your praise and the building up of your people, the church. Amen. It's a wonderful passage from the ninth chapter of Acts, often referred to as the conversion of Paul. I thought about that this week because although uh, nuance is not needed in, in either bumper stickers or in political slogans, uh, nuance is important in reading scripture. The danger of reading this as a conversion from being a Jew to being a Christian uh, is always present with us, and we always need to remember that's not what really happened to Paul. He remembered himself, claimed for himself his Jewish heritage. He always was a Jew right to the day of his death, but he was a Jew who had come to see, as some other Jews in that period began to see, that God's purpose was the calling in of all the nations into the covenant which God had established with Israel on Mount Sinai and confirmed over and over again. In fact, if you read the story of the conversion, as it were, of Paul, the call of Paul, and if you've read so much of the Old Testament prophets, you might see the comparison, the ways in which his call to ministry, to be the apostle to the Gentiles, to the nations, look an awful lot like the call of Jeremiah and Isaiah and others of prophets of old. And so his conversion is not so much conversion from one religious faith to another, but an expanding of his understanding of what God was doing. And as I think about this moment on the Damascus Road, I realized that this is the end of a journey or part of a journey for Paul. And I really believe that what had happened before this for Saul of Tarsus, a Jew of the Diaspora, was that from the very moment he's mentioned in Luke's Acts book, he's already on his way to Damascus to this change. And it begins, I think, when he hears Simon, when he hears Stephen, rather, that first martyr, say after he has been, just before he's stoned, do not lay, Lord, this sin to their charge. Echoing Jesus' words on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And here was Stephen, about to be stoned to death by a crowd in Jerusalem. And Saul of Tarsus sees it, and something happens deep within him, something which he fought against as he began to do more and more persecution of the followers of Jesus, the followers of the way, until he comes to that moment on the road to Damascus, where the voice of God, which has been knocking on the door of his heart, finally breaks through and he realizes that his life has to change. And so he becomes a different person. Many of my colleagues in the Episcopal Diocese, the Episcopal Church in New Hampshire, gather with our bishop, Rob Hirschfeld, for a lectionary Bible study on Tuesday afternoons as uh, my colleagues prepare for ministry and preaching. And even though I don't often preach, I love those, setting, those uh, discussions because I learn a great deal. And there are three questions that we often ask ourselves, and then we share our thoughts about it. Uh, and the questions which I asked myself this week. The first question is, what is Luke trying to teach us about God? The second question is, what is God, what is Luke trying to teach us about what we, the church, ought to be doing? And the third question, which I will not address this morning, but I hope you will, is what is Luke suggesting to us to hear God calling us individually, personally, each and every one of us? to witness, to deepen discipleship as followers of Jesus. I think what 
Luke is trying to show us in this passage from the ninth chapter of Acts is that God is a God of surprises. That God is a patient God. That God has been working on Saul of Tarsus for some weeks and months from the time of Stephen's stoning and martyrdom to the moment in which finally Paul's ears are opened as his eyes are closed as he is blinded by this vision and he hears Jesus speaking to him about his own life so the church believes in a God trusts in a God of surprises and a God of patience God works patiently in our lives as one of my mentors as a young priest once put it God's persistent birthing initiative. God is always seeking to bring something new, some new birth into our lives. As another colleague once said, with God, there's always something more. And so the church knows that God is a God of surprises, a God of love, a God who would not leave Saul of Tarsus in his anger and hatred for Jesus and for the followers of the way, but would bring him to a point where he could see that what he had seen in Stephen that day when Stephen met his martyr's death was a love which was conquered and would conquer the whole world. A love which was stronger than death. A love which shines in the darkness and as the first chapter of the gospel according to John puts it, which light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. That love is never overcome. And it's that love which God shows us as he shows it to Saul of Tarsus and invites him into a relationship of love with Jesus and with the members of the community of the way. The way of the cross, certainly, but the way of the empty tomb. So how is God calling us in the church these days? Well, I take as my little hint about that, Ananias. Here's Ananias, a follower of Jesus in the city of Damascus. Someone whose life has been touched by that love which Jesus showed up on the cross in the earthly ministry in which the community of the way shows him every day. And here he is challenged by God to move out of his comfort zone, to move someplace that he's very fearful about. Here's this persecutor of the community who is now somehow in their midst and perhaps has had a change of heart, a transformation. I think we're called as members of the disciples of Jesus, as members of what uh, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church calls the Jesus movement. We're called to that trust in God to take risky action, to step out of our comfort zones, to move into a, a new place for ourselves where the church can stand firm in its trust that God will be with us. I marveled each week as I drive through Jackson, uh, living in the, the town of Bartlett. I, I can't claim Jackson as, a, as my home, although I've been coming here since 1947 when I was just a baby. But I drive through Jackson from time to time during the week, and I'm always so pleased to see the sign outside Jackson Community Church proclaiming the good news, proclaiming the ways in which God is reaching out to touch us in this difficult time of pandemic. In this difficult time of struggling with how black lives have not mattered in our country, but now need to matter more and more. Not to the detriment of white lives, or blue lives, or anybody's lives, but to remember that all lives have to matter, and that means black lives matter. So we've been pushed out of our comfort zone. And I'm reminded of a story that a friend of mine told me. She was a member of a community that was working on drug houses, on working on condemned buildings in the city of Buffalo. And she went into uh, the judge's chamber before a uh, courtroom appearance about one particular house in her neighborhood. And when the judge told her and the group around her that he did not have the power to order that house to be demolished, order its demolition, uh, she looked at him and said, Your Honor, that answer is unacceptable. And she said later that she was way outside her comfort zone. She had taken a step that she never thought she'd take. 
as a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus, as a member of the Roman Catholic Church, as a teacher, but she took it. And when uh, a while later they went into court and they had the case heard before the judge, the judge looked at it and saw, uh, and Buffalo is a very Roman Catholic community, and I'm sure he saw lots of people who looked like his mother as he grew up in a Roman Catholic parish, sitting there looking at him intently. He did exactly what my friend wanted him to do. He ordered the immediate demolition of that drug house, clearing out a problem there in the neighborhood. We're called to move outside our comfort zones, I think, as Christians, and to do it together. There's a tradition in the Episcopal Church and in the Anglican Communion of Benedictine spirituality in which we are called to obey God, to listen for God's voice. We're called to conversion of life, that our life might be continually transformed. But in the middle of that, there's a call to stability. That is, to living in community, not to run away when things get challenging in community, when it's hard to live with some of the members of the community. Because I think it's the, the rubbing up against one another in community which helps us to grow, helps us to change, helps us to be better than we ever thought we could be. And so I think we're being called. During this coming week, I hope each of you, I will do it as well, think about those people that have called us into a deeper relationship with God and think about how we might indeed be called to new risk taking as disciples of Jesus. For the last year or so, one of the hymns from our Christian hymnal has been very, very important in my life. Uh, one that uh, is referred to as I, oh, For the Beauty of the Earth. And the text that I find particularly helpful to me is a text about human love. For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, Friends on earth and friends above, for all gentle thoughts and mild. Christ our God, to thee we raise. This our hymn of grateful praise. <laughs> We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Friends on earth, those we share worship with, those we share our life in Christ together, but also those friends who have gone on, friends who are no longer with us, but who indeed we believe are still rooting for us on the other side in God's nearer presence. One of those friends for me is a man who for many years and many years ago served as the rector of Christ Church, the Episcopal Church in North Conway, a guy named Don Nickerson. I, I live in a house, Jan and I live in a house which was Don and Sue's house where Sue was raised. Her dad owned the New England Inn across the street from our house. And a few weeks before Don's death last December, I knelt by his side in his home, his nursing home in Brunswick, Maine, and I asked him for a blessing. And without any hesitation, he prayed a blessing for me. And a portion of that blessing is engraved upon his tombstone, the family tombstone in the Kearsarge Cemetery. And sometimes I drive by there when I'm out and about. And I want to share this with you that we might actually go forth, as the blessing says, into the world in which we live, into the world in which we're called to witness to the love of Jesus. So this coming week and the weeks ahead, may we go forth into the world in peace. May we be strong and of good courage. May we hold fast to that which is good. May we love and serve the Lord with gladness and singleness of heart. Rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. And may God's blessing, the blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us this day and always. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Dan, for those words and for leading us today. We all appreciate. And we look forward to having you back in our virtual pulpit. Uh, sometime later this, perhaps this fall. Thank you all, the congregation, uh, for your contributions to support our church, our building, our missions, our outreach, and our pastoral leadership. Uh, 
whether the church is open for personal, uh, for, for uh, gathering or not, the work of our church goes on and we need your contributions as always. So would you please, in the offering plate, place your offerings, your pledges and all, and mail them to the church, the regular church address. Now we'll hear uh, Alan Labrieck, uh conclude our uh, service. First, we'll sing our benediction song, then he'll pay, play uh, part of a postlude, and we'll move into our online uh, coffee hour. So at this time, unmute yourself, and let's sing mightily our benediction song. Uh -huh. Thank you, Alan. And now, would anyone love a cup of coffee? <laughs> Unmute yourself if you want to participate, or you can just listen to the room. 